sometimes it would be as tiny as like reordering a few scenes. And sometimes it would be as big as like, okay, I guess that whole first act is completely different. Hey, how's it going? It's good. I'm uh, excited to get to talk to you. I've known I've known your work forever. I look up writers of things I'm obsessed with, and you're on two of my favorite shows. So. Oh, I'm so glad. <laughs> really glad to hear that. So nice to meet you. Well, okay. The first thing I want to ask you. So I saw you all at the Grammy Museum last night. and uh, Oh, awesome. You were there. That's so cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then I ran home and watched the film. Uh, so it's congratulations. It's amazing. Oh, thanks so much. I think you said you you first heard about the Chevalier when you were a teenager, like 15 or, or so. Yeah. How did you first find out about him and what was the the thing that made you want to write the story? Um, my mom gave me a book and I couldn't even tell you what book it was. I just remember reading like a paragraph, like in my memory, it was sort of like a little blurb that um, was comprehensive enough in telling and wetting my appetite, right? Or telling me who this person was. Um, and the thing that I think attracted me to him was just his life. Like his life. I mean, just like the, I think John Adams or was it John Adams or Brent Franklin? One of those guys, I'm pretty sure it was John Adams um, said that Joseph Ballone was one of the most accomplished men in Europe. And it was true. Like this, this guy was like a master fencer. He was a master horseback rider, knew multiple languages, was a, uh, was a bit of a romancer, um, obviously was incredibly gifted with a violin and with composition and with writing operas and um, popularized the quartet like this. I mean, his life and then like later in life, obviously went and became a soldier and a revolutionary. And this like this man lived like 20 lives in one. And to me, I think the astonishing thing was that it just sort of felt like a movie, like he felt like a movie character and he wasn't real. Um but I think I was more like, oh, my gosh, like, how how do people not know? About, how does everyone not know about this person? Like, I mean, how, you know, am I not taught about this person in school? Like I had been a couple of years prior, I had been in an orchestra and I played the cello. And, you know, we were, you know, in conjunction with uh, with actually learning our instruments. We were taught the history of classical music and um, taught at not, you know, taught at length about Mozart and Beethoven and their contributions, but he, Joseph was just never part of those conversations. So I think I felt a little like, you know, a little short change, like, oh my God, like this so it was someone's responsibility to teach me about this person and, and no one did. And I've just sort of stumbled upon him. And you and Stephen both said you didn't want to do like a cradle to the grave story, but his life was so fascinating before and after the events yeah. of this movie. So how did you choose where to pick up and, and end the story? Yeah, um, yeah I, I, if I had enough budget and time and and resources, I would do like the Joseph, like, you know, limited series, which I mean, would last episodes. And I mean, his life is just so I mean, it would go on for seasons it wouldn't even be limited. It would be unlimited. Um, but um, I think that the thing while looking at his life, I just, again, wanting to access this story from a personal perspective, because so much of it is, is, is so incredibly, so incredibly amazing. I, I just wanted to, um, to tell the story from a perspective that also felt personal to me, because that's, I think, probably the way that I felt like I could do it the most justice. Um, but I think the thing that was sticky in my brain was like, okay, this is someone who was really close with the monarchy and really chummy and friendly with Marie Antoinette and lots of wealth and uh, hanging out at Versailles. And then later in his life was taking up arms against them. And that to me was interesting. It's like, you know, how do you go from um, literally like walking shoulder to shoulder with these people and then finding like finding yourself compelled enough to actually like fight against them and like that like something must have happened there and there had to have been a shift or an ideological shift and um i think that aspect was the most interesting thing and it, it just that coming into awareness and coming into yourself and, and learning about yourself and and like discovering your identity through your creativity but also through um your responsibility maybe to that creativity um was something that I think on a very, on a very smaller scale, I probably was wrestling with at the time as well. And I, I've heard screenwriters talk about how TV writers tend to have a lot more agency over the, the end result than maybe feature writers because the directors are such a big yep. factor. As someone who's done pro like all TV work until now, I think, right? Like, 
How was that experience jumping into film for you as a writer? I, I think it was great. It was, it's different. You know, I think like the thing that you just pointed out, like that's the truth. Like the film industry is sort of built on the director and their vision. And I think, you know, largely historically writers have been um, marginalized in that world. I mean that with a lot of, a lot of love and affection, but that's just sort of the truth. Like, I mean, the screenwriters have been, um, replaceable and um, swapped out and I've seen it happen and it, it's a completely different I think a completely different world but at the same time not completely different at all so I think walking into this experience um, I think I think the expectation from some people was that you know that I wouldn't be maybe maybe I wouldn't be so involved because I was just the writer and I was going to pass it off. But luckily, like Stephen, because he comes from TV as well, like we were two people who were coming from TV, like we only know collaboration. Like that's just the only way we know how to work. And uh, I have been so lucky in television to, number one, have agency over my script, but but in a collaborative way, like I, I share the script to get like, you know, working with directors like Hiro Murai on it, uh, on Atlanta or Yana Gorskaya or Kyle Nuichek or Taika on what we do in the shadows. Like it's an incredibly collaborative experience where like, you just don't really know where the script or the direction ends and you're having conversations constantly and um, you're, you're constantly ping ponging off one another. So uh, that is what I know. And that's how I, I, I like to work. And um and that's how Steven likes to work too, because that's, you know, how he's worked. So long story short, it's like, that's how we came into this experience was, you know, being, I think, very vocal and very adamant and intentional about the, about the, the partnership that we wanted to have. And um, it was like him and I till the very end, <laughs> like protecting each other, honestly. And he was an incredible partner, incredibly gracious and in sharing all of that experience with me. And uh, I heard you say you, this was like the most drafts you've ever done of anything. It was like 24 or something. Uh, <laughs> what was the hardest thing to get right? And like, how, how big were the changes from draft to draft? Oh my gosh. Oh, <laughs> like, I mean, sometimes it would be as tiny as like reordering a few scenes. And sometimes it would be as big as like, okay, I guess that whole first act is completely different. Um, or that character who was in every single page is now not there anymore. Um, so it was really difficult. I mean, like, I mean, and I, I think that we got a lot right. That's the thing. I don't think that there were drafts, <laughs> there were drafts upon drafts because things were wrong. I think it's just, you know, studio notes. And <laughs> I, I think that like, you know, there's just like, when you're making a movie, there's so much more discussion. And I found it's again, very different from my experience in TV. And I've been very lucky in TV that I, I've had partners that, you know, support the script and uh, take care of that kind of thing. Uh, but Searchlight was incredibly, incredibly gracious and incredibly supportive, but it's a, again, a completely different, I think, um, a completely different experience where I, I think they're way more involved in different ways and you're balancing an incredibly larger budget and there's a lot of moving parts and um, it's just the nature of films are different. Therefore, there requires much more discussion and um maneuvering um i hope that answers the question i love everybody yeah. Yeah. <laughs> i love studio notes <laughs> no. but i mean but that's just, it was just part of the process and the process was just a, a, like a little bit different um and there were so many reasons that things kept shifting yeah no that makes sense that's great that's a great answer uh okay i think this is my last one for you i'm i'm very curious are you one of those writers do you listen to music while you write and if so what did you listen to while you wrote this? That is a great question. I do listen to music while I write. I listen to music, but I also put on movies. I, I mute movies that I like while I write and movies that I feel like I love and know very well. Like I know backwards and front. Um, and I think I did more of that. I, I put on Purple Rain a lot and muted it. And it was one of those things that as I was writing, I would look up and, you know, you sort of start watching it for a bit. And that movie I think had just like a cheekiness to it. It's a ridiculous film. I love it. <laughs> um, it is, it's, there's a silliness and uh, self-awareness about it that, that feels, I, I don't know, a little like unconventional and trying to inject some of that, I think into the flavor of the contemporary feel of Chevalier, I think was important. Obviously like I, I put on like Amadeus or I put on Sofia Coppola's Marie Antoinette just to like, truly immerse myself in the world and the textures and the feels and the um the shots and the the staging like all of that i think was really helpful i think when when writing 
um, when writing the movie. So more so that than music. That's so cool. All right. Well, I think that's uh, all I got for you today, but thank you so much. I, this film's amazing. I'm going to oh, tell everyone to go watch it. It's I great. It. <laughs> nice to meet you. Hope to talk to you again. Yeah, you too.